All right, bud. You good? We're here. Okay. All right. I actually don't know how it goes past those like first ten seconds. I'm I'm sorry. Huh? It's uh, it's just. <laughs> da, 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 da. You'll no, hear it. Like, you'll hear it when you you listen. Now, 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 now. <laughs> you listen to the episodes, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You got it. <laughs> it's just like that, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> welcome, welcome back to the Lost Beat Six Show Beefer Book Club. You know, this is our weekend edition. This is the found. This, this is the found beat six. You found us. Yes, and uh, <laughs> and I, I do have. We are going to be putting shows back together. I think some like uh, actual like legit interview program type podcast stuff. You know. Um, yeah, dude, we're coming back. We got puppets. We got. <laughs> we got. Uh, uh, we got magicians. We got. <laughs> we got uh, guys in Spider Man costumes. All that and more. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, starting around probably September, I think. I'm gonna. This, we we have some. We are gonna be working on some stuff this this August. So shows will be coming back. You know, uh, just so you know, if anybody's been listening to the show since the planets thing ended, um, the planets expose, which is not officially ended because I haven't finished the article because I. There's no, there's no pressure on me to finish it. Um, only you on just me. not finish it, and then technically, <laughs> technically, just keep everyone coming back for more. And just be like, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Update. Yeah, and when Stilly comes back from Montana, we'll do a beef session. But anyway, um, how are you doing, Sean? Oh, I'm doing fine this week. Um, I'm I'm considerably more awake uh, than I was last week. Um, <laughs> Last last week I was like literally like rolling out of bed, but I've actually been awake for several hours. That's good. <laughs> I I I actually just like slept until my whole body hurt from just being alive for too long, and I was like, I guess I I guess I should just get up and get up and face the day. <laughs> so. That's what I've been doing. Um, I've, I've been revisiting some uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild this week. I I, I stopped playing for a little bit, and I picked it back up. And uh, now I'm going to stop again, because I basically completed a whole dungeon except for the boss. And so I left the dungeon and did a bunch of exploring. And then when I came back, the whole dungeon, the whole puzzle dungeon had reset. And they were like, okay, now do it again, fucko. And I'm like, oh, so this is one of those games where you wander into the dungeon without the right equipment and then you get punished for doing that even though you had no way of knowing that you would need that equipment for that dungeon i'm like that's a great that's a great way to make a game so yeah my 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 breath of the wild score is is, is slowly dropping from like an eight nine to like a six seven <laughs> <laughs> i'm just I'm, I'm just saying just let a man come back and finish his fucking dungeon. Like, <laughs> like you got. If you're gonna make a game about uh, about exploration and like just going and finding the right tools for every job, let me come back and use my tools. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, totally. Anyway, I'm going. I'm going on my. I'm going on my. Um, I'm going on my rants. I'm going on. I'm going on my angry video gamer nerd rants. Sure. What do we do? <laughs> Get up? it together, game developers. <laughs> so, um, but, but I mean, other than that, yeah. um, that's been that's been pretty good. Uh, cool. I, I, I continue my book constipation this week. I actually picked up uh, a pretty good, uh, pretty good collection of short stories. It's uh, called Appendix N. It's uh, it's basically short stories um, that are mentioned in the uh, appendix of like the first edition of dungeons and dragons for like inspirational reading material okay and uh it's it's not it's not exactly all of them because like some of them are novels so some of it is like short stories from the same authors but i mean it's it's pretty cool it's got like the it, it, it's pretty dank it's it's got like clark ashton smith in there we've got hp lovecraft short stories in there we've got uh like jack vance short stories in there um I didn't. Even, I didn't realize this. I guess the uh, you know the basically the entire magic system in in D anD D is sort of lifted from uh, Jack Vance's Dying Earth series, 
which is already like a weird like post-apocalyptic adventure time sort of scenario where there's like people rediscovering magic after a you know after some world shaking cataclysm mm. and uh the whole deal with like there's you know minor spells that you can just kind of have memorized but then like every other sort of sorcery is you know you have to like read it from this like long ass like scroll um so it basically it's it's basically a, a system of nerfing magic wielders in a playable setting and that's why gary gygax liked it because i mean if you can do just like magic bullshit it's like you got to put some limits on that yeah but um yeah it's kind of cool it's like i like that the uh you know i like the origins of D are already kind of like sci-fi ish and uh you know they've, they've already got weird shit and then like there's like hp lovecraft like on the le- reading list too um like some of his uh some of his like Lord Dunsany shout out stuff, like the doom that came to Sarnath, I think is the one that's in this collection. Um, but yeah, like all of his like dreamland stuff is kind of also on that, like inspirational reading list. And then there's also actual Lord Dunsany short stories in this collection too. So you get like the whole, you get like the whole spectrum of like, of, of um, sort of more traditional sword and sorcery stuff. There's stuff by, uh, is it Fritz Lieber? Is that the guy's name? Uh, there, there's the guy who actually coined the word, the term sword and sorcery to like describe like fantasy writing. Um, I think it's Fritz Lieber. And he wrote, he wrote some stuff about like, uh, he, he had this series about this like barbarian and basically like a, like a, a rogue. If you'd consider him a, a D and D character, just like fucking around and having wizard adventures together. Um, but yeah, I've been enjoying that. I've been uh, I'm putting together a uh, I'm going to be DMing a session real soon, so I'm just kind of nice. I'm, I'm just in, I'm just in the headspace, so I've, I've I've been reading a bunch of you know I've been reading some modules and uh, going going whole hog. I'm going I'm going super hardcore. <laughs> I, I've been in the headspace as well, um, which is more on Homeric epics and classic you know classicism classicism. Class, classic, classical, yeah, classicalism. Cla- cla- <laughs> uh, yeah, if you're a classicist, you're like like the Greco-Roman like Ephesian, like you know, how yeah. speak, those people who knew how to speak Latin and ancient Greek. But uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. But um, we're we, essentially we, filling time here because I forgot to watch. Uh, yeah, uh, Woodstock, the Woodstock '99 documentary. So bear with it, us, folks. So this is all this is all hot and fresh off well, the cuff. It, yeah, so what we'll, we'll this have is what to, you're here for. <laughs> we'll have to do is um, we're gonna. You know, talk sometimes about, when that sometimes when that beef slides off the barbecue grill, you just gotta pick it up off the ground and put throw it, it right back on there, like nothing happened. Yeah. <laughs> but we we will talk about it because I'm gonna lose interest in memory if I don't discuss it now. And then yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I did see about I watched that documentary that the ringer and those people the ringer i have like a love hate relationship with and most of it's the hate comes out of like envy and what was um, what was the ringer the ringer is a podcast uh like a like a content creation network based by uh, sports uh, writer bill simmons oh okay and he basically in like the mid like 2015 or so he like like left espn and went to like hbo or started his own company, like uh, shadow funded by HBO, which is oh for, shit, <laughs> like Warner Brothers or whatever. But beyond that, um, and created what they call the Ringer, and it's like a giant network of podcasts. Um, um, and then on top of it, they're like sports writing, and then pop culture. It's like it's, it's sport. Like his whole thing is like sports, tech, pop culture. Oh, okay. okay. And so that's his whole thing. So when you when you talk about and and this is my Ringer rant, if you will. Because I like the Ringer for the most part. Uh, their sports stuff's usually on the nose, on the right, like on the on the money, because that's they're mostly a sports thing. Um, and their press, like their media stuff's pretty good. Um, their music takes are the are the shallowest and most superficial <laughs> you could probably come up with. It's like, right. oh, first podcast, first music. Like we're trying to get a music podcast together. What are we gonna do? I don't know. Let's let's. Let's break down Kanye's graduation or 808s and Heartbreak. We're gonna break down Kanye West albums, greatest of all time. Like I don't give two <laughs> sh- fucking like. We're gonna like break down the most popular 
uh, you know, one percenter like of musicians, and it's like this is, it's every time someone starts. Yeah, it's like they pop, don't need the uh, they they don't need the, the shout out like they're <laughs> like no they're no fine. no it's it's not really like like there's only a handful of people I actually trust when it comes to music journalism, mm. uh, or modern music journalism, and I funny enough it's actually like the biggest one is like Anthony Fantano. <laughs> <laughs> like i, don't I, mean, I guess have there's to... a re- i guess there's a reason he's so popular <laughs> i mean the dude's been doing it for like 10 plus 15 years i don't know how long he's been doing that that like both the needle drop and but his music business element like stuff it takes have been really like oh yeah i agree with this and this and this and this and it's been more like wide the, his breadth of what he likes is yeah is, yeah is is far more um like oh this guy actually listens to shit like he, he like not to say he like ringer doesn't but it's like the ringer audience does not care about um death grips yeah <laughs> like I, I like the like or like they they're they're so that's the episode title right there the ringer the ringer does not care about death grips <laughs> i'm writing it down but um like like but uh, and it's hard to say because like a lot like a lot of like Fantano probably came to his claim to fame or his big like motor to, motor to success was mostly like MU on 4chan to to, a, to <laughs> some certain extent. So like MU has this certain like patrician taste. Uh, I'm sure it's like you have to like the Money Store, Court of the Crimson King, um, Kid A, um. And Trout Master the three yeah. greatest <laughs> records of you have, all time. You have to like. You have to like. <laughs> actually, you have to like know why Trout Master Replica is a masterpiece. Um, yeah. No. I, you know yeah, okay. I, mean? <laughs> like, yeah, I dig that. Yeah. That kind of thing. <laughs> so like, you know, it's it's uh, uh, like I would love to say, hey, you know, like, you know, hey, the the, the writers at the ring, the, the music, and also not only that, the the um, the pop, the movie people there mostly. Um, they're really it, it's also not like it's like both both the movie the film and film tv and and uh, um music writers at the ringer in my opinion they tend to have this like scratching the surface mentality of what's down if if not like with the exception of the stuff they're really into which is more like the obsessive canon uh nerdist culture of like we're going to break down everything behind game of thrones and why xyz is important in this tv show and like they really did a good job of course being partners with hbo they really ran with that um but like uh like we're gonna break down marvel lore star wars lore i'm like okay um (laughs) star wars lore here's the deal guys star star wars doesn't really have that okay i hesitate to say that star wars doesn't have good lore but i'm like Star Wars doesn't need good lore. <laughs> no, and here's the thing: is this, because it, the funny thing is, it's all based on. And I, I've also been li- like doing a based on my classicism stuff. I've been re-listening to a couple uh, or one of my favorite professors and um, of uh, classes classical um, te- theory and teaching and stuff like mythologies and stuff is Elizabeth Vandiver, and she does like a lot of great courses that I listen to on Audible. She does a great. She does a great Odyssey. She does a great Iliad. She does a great um, Herodotus, and she's. I'm listening to her mythology one, and she breaks down why she's not down with Joseph Campbell. <laughs> and, and of course, like the monomyth is like, monomyth is like the pop culture. Like, oh, every story has this interlying thing. It's like, well, there's yeah, way Joseph more Campbell examples. can be kind of reductionist. Like, yeah, I, I yeah, that, like I've read. I was I, I was really excited. I got a book of um. I got a book about like uh tarot cards that he wrote uh one half of it and i was like oh that sounds really good and then um his his half of it is like really boring and like just like oh yeah the the major arcana is about the uh uh the three estates of like the medieval period and represents the the different classes and i'm like oh that's I guess, <laughs> <laughs> and, well, it, and then like the whole other half of the book is clearly a guy who's like, he's like really tearing into the like esotericism and um, the sort of like astrological connections, mm-hmm. and so it's like the first half is like so lame, and then the second half is like so crazy, and I'm like, why did I'm like, how did these two meet each other? Like, why did they write this book together? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, that's you know what I'll, I'll name drop it. I got it right here on my shelf. Sure. Um, tarot, tev, tarot revelations. 
Joseph Campbell and Richard Roberts. Um, Colin Wilson does the introduction. He's a pretty good writer. He's got, uh, if you've read the, he's got a book just called The Occult, which oh. I haven't read, but from what I understand is a pretty good what introduction. Was the, what was to the that name of the, ro- who's, who co-wrote that? Um, okay. Richard Roberts is the guy who co-wrote it. Um, the introduction is by Colin Wilson. Um, tarot revelations. It's pretty hilarious. Like okay. Joseph Campbell's like intro is just like, it's super short. It, it, like, I think it's like 50 pages of a, of like a, of like a 300 page long book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's, it's interesting. Cause like, it, and it's funny that he's starting to, he was writing things on tarot cards and like, I know that's a big thing right now. Like it's, it's something I see trending everywhere, like, uh, especially on, on the grams and whatnot. I know there's a few friends of mine that are doing that. Um, yeah. Like all, all the, all the witchy art ho girls are, yeah. they're all tarot and, card readers now. And it's, what's funny is it's just like, and, and it's, you, you mentioned, you know, Campbell being a, a, a reductionist, right? And yeah. So, yeah. Of course, like tarot cards, just like, you know, astrology is essentially like reverse engineering. Um, <laughs> if you ask me, that's, and that's just me as a very, like, as like a skeptic where it's just like, it, it, you know, it's funny. Like I'm, I'm technically, uh, my Zodiac is a Capricorn. And if you look mm-hmm. up a Capricorn, I go, yeah, that's me. And I did one with Eric and like, he's, uh, I don't know what April is. P- P- um, uh, April is probably, let's see what comes after Pisces. I think it's, um, Look, I'm not. I'm not an astrologer. I know I'm a huge yeah, cultist. Yeah, I'm, yeah. A, I'm. I'm the local wizard, but like, I really don't follow astrology that much. Here, let me look I do up. ritual magic. People, I'm not a fucking. <laughs> I'm not an expert in all of this. Oh god, uh, I should probably. That's uh, that's actually a pretty embarrassing gap in my knowledge. <laughs> okay, uh, it's it's um, Aries. I thought it was Aries. Aries. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and he he. <laughs> His description of him, uh, if you know, we were just kind of going over this, like each other, like, and he does not fit an Aries at all. Like, it's just like, <laughs> nope, I don't do any of this. Nope, 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 nope. And it's just like, and I can vouch for that. It's not like, oh, I. So the idea. Okay, like, but what if in the description of Aries is like one of their personality traits is that they don't believe in astrology? No, that's the, that's what I told the Capricorn <laughs> people do. So I was like, Capricorns are skeptical of astrology. So like, maybe the problem with Aries is that they just have bad self introspection. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, cause I think I think uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah Cap- like, no. Capricorn. Okay, no. <laughs> Okay. Was, yeah, Capricorns are far more uh, are, are are more the intellectual kind of introverted. Um, one said know it all. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and by that meaning, I'm like, yep, yeah, this is not this is nonsense, and this is correct, but it's also nonsense. Yeah. Like, <laughs> See, so, I think the deal with tarot cards is the way I use them is sort of a, a, a sort of a weaponized apophenia, uh-huh. uh, not not uh, not unlike a. Um, you know, not unlike um, like a Rorschach test or something like that, right. where you can sort of use them to uh, you sort of use them to focus your thoughts and, uh, you know, looking at the, you know, looking at sort of arcane symbols and imagery, you can kind of uh, the things that are like popping out to you from examining these symbols is like, oh, well, maybe this is things that are uh, this is things my brain and subconscious are thinking a lot, thinking about a lot heavily. So, um, you know, using this sort of tool to focus them and, uh, sort of focus them and bring them to the surface um, is a way to, you know, I, that, that's how I think the, the that's how I think the tarot reading works, where it's like the, right, right. you know, you can you can sort of like explain the iconography and then like how the person responds to it is sort of like okay, well, this is what they're thinking about, so work on that, work on those aspects of your life. Yeah, I come from I come from it from a uh, uh, sort of the uh, like the Jodorowsky like uh, he calls it psycho magic, but I mean essentially more of a uh, a, a tool for personal growth rather than as a, as a, uh, you know, a fortune telling device. Right. Okay. I think if you're, I, I think the, I think, I think the more you can analyze, I think the more you can honestly, uh, sort of see, you know, the sort of subconscious things on your mind, um, the easier it is to see like, Oh, where's this fucking headed realistically? Mm-hmm. You know, that's my, that's my theory behind it. Right. So star Wars, uh, yeah, so fuck Star Wars. Fuck Star Wars. <laughs> so the Lord. problem with Star Wars is it's based it's based on the monomyth, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So that being said, 
uh, you really handicap yourself as far as other mythology is concerned. And you can sort of, there's a, there's a, I, I would argue there's a false uh, sense of uh, like, like a narrative or whatever that there's like, George Lucas created this giant sandbox. And I think we've talked about this a couple of times because I think like, for example, like the new Mandalorian series, the second, yeah, yeah. The, the new season, uh, the second season, everybody was like tripping balls about like all these different like Easter egg mentions from like earlier myths. And the problem is like, it, it's good for like, it's good for um, content creators like the ringer to describe, Oh, here's what grand Admiral Thrawn was. And this is why uh, this lightsaber, this is what so-and-so is so important about this, why X, Y, and Z, about these things that are happening in this universe. And I'm just like this, well, first off Disney, I thought they canned that. <laughs> when they, yeah, I know. You because, know, they're uncanning it. They're uncanning it because uncanny, everyone hates the stuff they unca- actually wrote. Ironically, it's, it's a purple. Un, un, coincidentally, it's the uncanny valley effect. Um, but uh, they're they're recanonizing all these things that were like, which were written by not Lucas, but written by sci-fi and, and fantasy writers from like Del Rey. Yeah, um, yeah, and a lot of whatever the other uh, fantasy publishers were, and. Um, they're all check marked and cleared by Lucas. It was like, yeah, whatever, whatever. And I think we described this, <laughs> you know, like we described. We talked about this last week when I was discussing the Yuuzhan Vong. Uh, oh yeah, that's D&D right. That's right. Thing. And and of course that was the big like, oh, Chewie dies and like because he gets crushed by a planet. And they have like, they finally have a, like an anti force, like something that actually matches the force. Um, yeah, because yeah. They're, because it's bio weaponry. Um, so mm-hmm. it's like living things are actually involved with the material being moved about and you can't just like force speed run your way out of a scene when you get trapped to do a thing like episode one. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, and the, the problem, so anyway, going back and there's like, there's a, there's things like there's the films, there's these movies and these stories, these simple, uh, uh, uh archetypal films based on, uh, what, Campbell would consider like like the sort of like uh, uh, the reason and probably there probably is like the only the only way that Campbell has like a point is that maybe like humans don't have like that expansive imagination for telling stories as far as like these things have to happen in order to be to tell a self a self to tell a satisfying story Mm -hmm. Um, so like you know if we're going to talk about like oh how many times did Greek like legends go to the underworld and come out of it and resurrect and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's, and then like Jap, the Japanese and Polynesian and, and, and uh, native American and like all these different tribes have these different legends of these, they all said the same, but like, they're also very, um, some of the most entertaining of those stories too. And of course they all are teaching different things based on the culture. Right. So like, yeah, I, yeah. I guarantee you that like, someone's re like if 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 Campbell is to tell me the Odyssey's ha- the story of the Odyssey happened in three and we'll get and this is going this is going to lead into my next thing um if you tell me the Odyssey is being told in three different cultures simultaneously or different points in you know their thing the, the themes are not the same um even though the structure or the narrative is similar so like I guarantee you that like I, I like almost guarantee you that there's probably not like because the point of the point of the Odyssey in in certain themes is how, um, um, the concept of Xenia is is honored, and Xenia mm-hmm. means uh, um, how you treat a foreigner. Um, oh okay okay. So like basically, uh, if you look at through uh, the Odyssey, um, and Xenia is also the root for xenophobia. Um, oh okay. So uh, X E N I A, I think it's spelled. Oh okay. In okay. English, but um, so it's it's that's the that's a major core theme of who honors. And, so basically, if someone comes to your house, how do you treat that person? And most people, and this is this is a common theme. This is you know, obviously the, you treat the, you, you curse them for you curse them to wander <laughs> the ocean eternally for for forty years. <laughs> well, if you're talking about the Cyclops that did that, um, you know. Uh, uh, you know, Cyclops ate people and, you know, didn't trust anybody. They were basically just like, they dishonored, they did not, they did not, um, <laughs> yeah, true. honor not, Zania. I think the, like, the, the problem is, the, the, the problem is that Odysseus just picked a shitty place to go wash up. 
<laughs> I mean, he, he, like like he had a choice in that storm, right? But the uh, <laughs> there's a, that's a common theme. So Cersei, I want the like, I want the American version of the Odyssey where like everything's just Odysseus's fault because he didn't. He just didn't pull himself up by his own bootstrap hard enough. <laughs> yeah. Like, fuck the whole fate and destiny thing. It's just, you know, it's just like, yeah, well, he should have just fucking known better. Like, why do you even go to war? Like, why do you, what? That's so stupid. He should have known better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of, like, Athena being replaced by, like, Lady Liberty or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, anyway, uh, 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 fuck. The uh, point being, so, like... But I don't know if that that that's a cultural staple of of the ancient Greeks that it's trying to be taught those things, uh, and those are you know same thing with like the Iliad with reputation and honor like wartime like things and how that's being how that's being taught to that culture at the time. So when you hear it like like, and possibly you know like I said you could reduce that like say the the. Uh, dare I say the narrative story because Jesus, the story of Jesus Christ is one of those uh, that Campbell throws into the narrative monomyth as well. And it's like part of that is also, you know, something that you could say, well, there's Sania in that too, but it's not really, depending <clears throat> on who you're talking to, it's not the core value. It's so anyway, um, I could be wrong about that too because I'm like, yeah, this, yeah, I could, I, I'm thinking about it now and I could, I could, I can retrofit that into that, you know. Like, oh, yeah, tr- golden rule. <laughs> Plug in <laughs> golden rule here. Plug in golden rule there. Zinnia, it's just the golden rule, right? Um, but there's other things regarding that beyond just the golden rule that are more ritualistic or more traditional, based on traditions. But anyway, I'm going to tell you right now that I've been watching, uh, re-watching. I did, I did I rewatched a couple things. One is, uh, I'll start with the Iliad side of things. I, I rewatched the Netflix BBC. It was like a British-American production of uh troy fall of the city okay cool cool um it's all available on netflix and it's um it's sort of i don't know i don't know whose idea it was to put together but it's sort of it's pretty much you know it's the iliad plus yeah yeah everybody like what people don't know is the iliad is like a small fraction of a of the the larger story it's like it's like year 10 takes place in the 10th year of the whole war <laughs> oh, it's, shit. Like, it's midway it's like it's kind of in the middle of everything so everything's kind do, of do they think there's more of the uh uh is there like more like like lost fragments of like uh, epic y- poetry about it sort so is, of it's more like the mahabharata like a like a giant like cycle rather than like uh a it, little it, bit. Like, like, is the Iliad like a Bhagavad Gita to a Mahabharata that's like not around anymore? Uh, kind of. It's it's the Iliad is like I, don't, I think it's a it's an epic poem in its own right. It's a self contained epic poem. There's uh-huh. like clearly a beginning and there's clearly an end to basically like what's the subplot is what's the subtitles like the Wrath of Achilles. Mm-hmm. Um, now there probably are other uh, Homeric poems uh, or home of uh, of that reflect on the Trojan War. And I know oh, okay. there's been, been several, like, and tragedians have discussed other stories regarding the Trojan War. But the idea of the Trojan War itself, it, part of it is because, um, and this is one of the things about uh, ancient Greek literature at, at large, is that there's already preconceived notions of what we know, or what they would know as common knowledge. So uh-huh. they kind of, it's all in their mythology that they would already understand. So they don't need to be told the entire Trojan War because they kind of know what happens. Oh, okay, you know? okay. So we don't need we don't need the judgment of Paris where like you know Athena offers you know, uh, God like uh, Athena and Hera and Aphrodite offer like their best, you know, for the, for the fairest goddess and and you know Zeus is like okay pick one buddy and he's like uh, I want the girl so he goes with. <laughs> So he goes with Aphrodite and thus causing, you know, the Helen issue and, you know, that sort of thing. And um, the cool thing about that is a lot of people kind of can play around with the, the interpretations of this thing. And this is kind of another subtopic I'm going to go into mm. um, because it's like people say, oh, that's inaccurate. I'm like, no, nah, I don't know if it's really inaccurate because it's like fucking who depends on who's telling the story, you know? Yeah, true. Um <laughs> Because it was an, it was all this stuff in like those other epic poems. The reasons they didn't make it is that no one wrote them down. So, um, and then we also get newer translations as scholars 
go back and look at the material and some of the other ancient versions. So you get like a King James Bible uh, kind of vibes where you're just like, oh, that's how that Bible was written. That's how this Bible. Then you see how the telephone effect sort of, you know, features. Yeah, it sort of you know. it slowly mutates as it as it hits other languages. And... Exactly. So, um, <laughs> if someone want, and someone could retell the story, I know I have a I have a new version of the Odyssey that was like recently reinterpreted. Um, it's not like changing the story, but it's changing the dialect of how it's um, spoken. Um, so anyway. Where I'm going with this, I guess, is I they this this Netflix show does a pretty good job of like expanding on like because I, I will say the the Benioff written the guys the I, Benioff who's a Game of Thrones writer uh, co producer co creator um, wrote the Brad Pitt Eric Bana Peter O'Toole uh, oh Troy. yeah I, I don't know he wrote that yeah <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. And I, I people, you know, most people think it's it's a pretty, it's a it's a it's a popcorn action, ancient action pick. And I kind of like they they took liberties that I'm not as down with, um, and it's okay, but it's a little Hollywoodish, um, and it's still kind of a guilty pleasure because I still like the way Achilles is portrayed with the Myrmidons and the um, you know Agamemnon is treated like the way it would. But the problem is there's the the way people that kill off characters the wrong way (laughs) (laughs) and the thing is you have to do that in a hollywood film that no one gives a shit about the greek epics so we know that like okay so like we we kind of know that agamemnon is like the biggest jerk in the entire like he's kind of a bad guy you're like as we the people that know greek poetry we want to side with the greeks most of the time yeah Uh, yeah achilles odysseus these are our those are our like likable protagonists but within that camp you have agamemnon who's just like a who's like a, you know, they're king of kings, he's ambitious, he wants to take out Troy, he wants the Dardanelles, you know, depending on who you talk to, like, there's a, there's a practical reason and a mythologi- mythological reason for taking Troy. Um, yeah, yeah. And Herodotus is kind of, like, plays around with that, too. But, um, uh, basically, you know, Agamemnon, big prick. Like, kills his, <laughs> kills his, the winds, the like, Artemis. take, Agamemnon. Hot- Kind of Agamemnon, like, kind of cringe. He kind of sets himself up for his own death before he even leaves out for Troy because he kills his daughter because he owes Artemis some sort of sacrifice, and Artemis is also a giant prick. Um, <laughs> she, she's like, "I, you killed my favorite doe, you know, in, in the in the woods, so you have to kill your daughter so you can get the winds out." I'm like, "Who? Fuck you!" <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, fuck Artemis. You know, like, yo, so, put your fucking deer away, bitch. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, come on, man. Like, and, she, and, she, and she's always like very temperamental, and she's just like, oh god. Anyway, I can't stand Artemis for the most part. Um, uh, but anyway, dude, you're gonna end up wandering around lost in the fucking ocean uh, for forty years. Like, this. <laughs> <laughs> you, I see, you've learned nothing from the Odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You, you, the, the role is the Iliad. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you got to choose a goddess, choose Athena because she's gonna she's gonna back you all the way. But um, anyway, point being is you know they there's a whole element of that stuff where you know he but his 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 like poetic justice comes after the Trojan War where his his um, wife Clytemnestra kills in his in her lover while she while he was out fighting and she was having an affair with some guy and they, they, he comes back and kills, kills him in the spoils. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's, that's more of a poetic justice because the way he kind of took out Troy, he was like throwing babies over the walls and stuff. And like, um, anyway, they just show that in the, 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 the Hollywood Troy one. It's like, Oh, well, so-and-so like one of his, um, you know, one of the ladies that he won in the spoils of war, you know, uh, kills him and it's like okay i guess that's you know you're not gonna wait until they all come home and he's gonna die anyway but uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> things like that um this new ver- this newer version uh does a pretty good job one they throw the gods in there is actually being sort of in the way like they kind of halfway through this halfway through the show they sort of disappear which is sort of weird <laughs> They forgot about it. Just him like in real life, they just, just fuck like, off when you need them. Yeah, the they, most. they 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 kind of start the whole thing, and then uh, and put it into motion, and then at the end of it, like they um, they kind of just like, oh, I guess you know that happened. Um, so anyway, the show is the show itself is really um, it's it's sort of hit or miss because they're playing around with 
the narrative of the Iliad. It's just like most other stories where it's like there's things that I wish was di- were different, you know, and things that I wish were better. Things were like it's like see, there's not a real. I don't think of like you t- you could take any version of the movie and make it, um, or version of like any like like Robert Fagel's like translation and make it into an actual movie because it's just like yeah. why are everybody's why are they all acting this way like who, who yes. does this? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's kind know, of bizarre. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like you ever see like the there's an old um, there's an old version of like Oedipus Rex that's like uh, put on by a bunch of like Golden Dawn enthusiasts. Um, yeah. And and so they're and they're doing it in these like, you know, like masks, like costumes and stuff. It's really trippy and weird. Um, I feel like I feel like sort of giving it its ritualistic context is probably the uh, probably the best way to portray it but that's going to be super fucking alienating and weird to normies yeah <laughs> so i totally i totally understand why they why they wouldn't right right it's it's um this version does a good job achilles is well played they have like what i kind of like they have like it's an interracial cast so achilles uh-huh. and the myrmidons are like black but it's not like oh my gosh they got a it's like like oh my gosh they got a black judas it's like no they got the best actress for the job yeah <laughs> um but you know they, Sorry, they have fucking no it's here. all good they have the uh sort of the the loose relationships between like you know uh patroclus and and achilles you know like probably were lovers and then they have like the spoil i when i say spoils i'm, I'm thinking of like when they captured this town or whatever they would get um they would get the the money they would get like a bunch of treasures and stuff but women were captured as well as in they were kind of uh-huh. what they call spoils of war and so that was part obviously that's one of the, if anybody knows the the iliad that's an actual big focus is that uh agamemnon takes and i think rapes a daughter of like a, of a priest of apollo and apollo sends a plague on the greek camp and obviously they go you gotta you gotta let her go because we're all dying because of you just <coughs> you, yeah. you, you fucking up. And it's like, okay, well I, how come I can't get any, like I'm, I'm the leader of this bunch and why can't I get anything? I'm going to take Achilles girl. It's like, and Achilles is like, well, fuck you. I'm not fighting. Like, <laughs> and that's, that's the plot <laughs> yeah. of the Iliad. That's, that's just the petty fucking, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just the, the petty gay spats between the, between right. the Greek warriors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so anyway, it's it's a uh, it's a solid it, it's it's pretty dark actually. It's in the Trojan War is a dark story. People kind of forget that, um, mm-hmm. where it's like yeah, a town got like annihilated, and people don't kind of under and a lot of other people unless you're like a Dan Carlin fan don't understand like when you siege a city for a long time, um, you the 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 the, the, the sieging the B, I think besieging army the one doing all the sieging. Mm-hmm. Um, the seizures uh uh tend to when they go through that town and they finally breach the walls they go to it, it's it's like extremes of human um aggression yeah uh, <laughs> let's put it that way and it's not saying it's good or bad it's definitely bad but it's also just like by that point all the soldiers are just like well you know we ha- we were stuck here for like 10 years you're putting up this fight. As soon as this goes down, it's like 10 years of pent up aggression. Yeah. Going through <laughs> yes, all the town. Like brutal. It's yeah. like, cause all the people they lost, all the people they lost is it's like, it's, there's a whole emotional, like, um, you know, uh, yeah, there's a huge release of, of pent up anger. And yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's true with most, uh, uh, ancient, uh, and even maybe not as, not so ancient. Um, uh, struggles in terms of like cities and castles and fortresses being besieged and taken over depending on who's in them um so it's really a really dark darker tone um and it but it's a little more accurate to the uh actual kind of myths that we know about uh in terms of like except uh, like 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 paris is killed off you know uh, uh prime killed off like like all the three women are that were captured are captured and the kids, you know, the babies are all thrown off bridge, you know, thrown off, um, <laughs> Jesus. And stuff. it's like, Oh, and Hel- Helen yeah. is, Helen is recaptured and taken back. It's not like, yeah, that's fucking hardcore. Yeah. The one they do in, um, like the one they do in the Hollywood version, it's like, Oh, Paris and Helen just run away. Cause Menelaus was killed off earlier. 
Yeah. And Menelaus <laughs> never got killed off. Yeah. And, like Hector killed Ajax, but Ajax was probably killed by Odysseus in a battle for Achilles' armor. A lot of different shit like that. Like a lot of yeah. different like um, things like that where it's it's like oh man like got a you know uh, anyway. So I saw that. And then, uh, uh, just to kind of bounce off that, I've been also watching this, um, uh, this French, there's this French, um, I don't know who makes it again, French. Um, but on Amazon prime, there's this, uh, great Greek myths that is done by a, a French animation company. Oh, sick. All right. And they All do right. this wonderful job of, and I've, I've been following this for the last three years. Um, cause they came out with new seasons and like one was just like m- all the different myths, the gods, goddesses, um, standards, Theseus, Perseus, uh, Odysseus, no, not Odysseus, um, Oedipus, all these, like the big standards. And then they, the next two seasons they did Iliad and the next one after that they did the Odyssey. And, um, for the most part, the, and it's another one of those things where it's like, is that accurate? Is that really? And like, and, and, and <laughs> like, and for the most part, it, they are relatively accurate. And like I said, accuracy is kind of a mixed bag and probably not a real thing in these myths because they are myths told over uh, 1,500 years. Or 2000, yeah. 20, 2,500, yeah. 20, 30,000 to 2,500 years. So I mean, it's pretty uh, subjective experience, too. Like, I right. imagine the actual way to listen to it is probably like a dude in an amphitheater or just like wandering around town, like telling portions of it, you know. So yeah. it's, you know. Uh, it's probably supposed to be interpreted kind of subjectively anyway. Yeah. Uh, the cool part about this program though, is that it, um, it, it, uh, portrays the anim. There's like the silhouette animation style, but it, mm-hmm. it, it fluctuates between that. And then like, um, Western art from like the Louvre and a bunch of, and a couple other different, like giant, um, you know, master like artists that have recreated these scenes in the mm-hmm. in the more western like dialect and we're not just talking like renaissance art and stuff we're talking like you know there's a gustav klimt of like athena um there's a um like there's like uh modern art versions like you know abstract shapes of you know different scenes in the of course like like that and i think because of the titles we kind of assume that's the themes the themes being portrayed and stuff so they it's a beautiful job of like showing off the uh the fact that these these myths and these stories have been like the prime like a prime uh, um, muse for like future visual artists down the road, um, which is kind of cool. It kind of uh, um, kind of contradicts uh, that that Umbridge guy that was arguing with Monty Python about yeah the greatest art. Jesus Christ is, is <laughs> Jesus Christ has inspired the greatest artists and the greatest art. I'm like uh, that in. Uh, that and everybody else so like, like yeah, that and the it. greeks you know um so that, that's it's a really you know some of those interesting pieces like oh that's in, they have these um so it's a great visual experience and you're getting these interesting st- re- stories retold because like everything i've myth wise i learned from like edith hamilton's like uh collection of, of the myths um and that's kind of almost like 100 years old now um yeah, true. That's the one you all read in like high school in like sixth grade and stuff. The, the myths and the yeah, those, and... those are getting yeah, those, the, those are even getting pretty archaic. Like we're probably gonna have yeah. to we're, we're gonna have to do a, a Space Jam two, but for uh, <laughs> have to do the Iliad two, for... <laughs> a new legacy. <laughs> A yeah, new, we're a new Kleos. <laughs> yeah, um, so, so it's like Achilles like uploads himself. It's into teammate the, time. Um, he uploads himself into the the Warner Brothers computer and <laughs> has to go. Uh, <laughs> oh I my take god! It you saw I, that? Did you watch that? I, I want to. I'm, I'm you okay. know, I'm gonna. I'm surprised I'm gonna you double, remember what I said. I'm yeah, gonna double, I'm gonna like double feature the. Uh, I'm gonna, I want to. I want to double feature the first one and the second one, just like make myself extra sad. Because from what I understand, <laughs> it's like the, the first one's like I like. I, I haven't seen it. I just know it from like memes and shit. And everyone's sure. like, yeah, "This movie's fucking awesome." I'm like, yeah. I didn't see that shit when I was a kid. I just, I just didn't. I didn't like sports, so I didn't watch it. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, uh, it's not as bad as I remember. It wasn't like nostalgia critics like I hated this movie. I'm like, yeah, okay. I don't hate it as much as this guy does. 
Um, I'm, I, I'm going to, but anyway, it's, it's, it's fine. You know, it's, and now it's like got a nostalgia bump towards, but anyway, I'm going to conclude, um, that whole, uh, French animation thing with the, uh, the third season does the Odyssey, uh, replays okay, the okay. Odyssey and it replays it f- and like, and everything else has been fairly accurate and interestingly retold. Um, but all of a sudden, this the 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 writers or whatever like add in this extra like uh, they they added it in their own like subplot of what the, the Odyssey. Fuck? Yeah. How are you gonna do okay. that? Here's how here's how they I'm gonna tell you here's how they did it. Um, so basically, they kind of have this like assume assumption that like the gods have lost all power. Um, after the fall of Troy, because man is like they're they're, re- they're reaching like humanistic values of like we don't need these gods anymore because we, we can take down cities and stuff, and the gods didn't protect this city and and like Odysseus is basically like wow we just fucked up an entire of course Odysseus is like in the Odyssey in the Iliad he's our voice of reason in the in the and it's always been the most rational sounding he's the, he's the smartest guy in the entire in both poems. Um, and so he's always kind of like a protagonist because we kind of relate to him in terms of that sort of like vibes uh, of reasonableness. Um, but he does this whole thing where he, he puts on the, the Stephen Fry argument for atheism. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the reason I say Stephen Fry is I remember him, I remember him in an interview saying like, you know, why does God let little kids go hungry at night and they'll suffer and this and this and this, you know, like all these all the disease. How dare you like allow all these things to happen? These are your kids. These are, this is you like, you know, very reasonable God, argument. <laughs> why would God let these things happen? And it's all, it's a very reasonable argument, but it's also very like, uh, it's extremely, uh, I was going to say pathetic, but I'm going to say amount of pathos involved with like assuming like just the argument for that is very, um, rhetorically divisive. But, um, and so that point being is that, um, they do the same thing with the Odyssey, apparently, which is nowhere in the books, nowhere in the story, <laughs> where it's like, you know, uh, yeah, that's would... extremely a, uh, uh, that's a, that 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 is a very extremely um, like bougie twenty first century yeah. ideal to like put on that, <laughs> and and so like Z- there's a whole story about like like Zeus and Athena, like everybody's gone from Mount Olympus except for like Athena and Zeus and Zeus, of course, for different reasons, but most of the fact that like the gods kind of had their own civil war during the Trojan war because they split and took different sides and like, you know, certain people Mm -hmm. fluctuated and stuff. Um, but anyway, like Zeus is like, Oh, Odysseus has this thought about, and basically they're calling it the evil men call atheism. It's like, oh my god! It's like, uh, <laughs> that's that's fucking cringe. <laughs> it's pretty cringe, and it's and it's like Zeus has to die because he can't think this way, or sorry, Odysseus has to die because he can't think. And the thing is like, well, if we save him, maybe he'll change his mind. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? <laughs> like, I, also, I that doesn't happen. That does that doesn't happen. He just spends like. He spends his whole life suffering for basically no reason. Like that is like super not the yeah. <laughs> that's it, that's a real bad take to have on it's, that. <laughs> it's it it really does kind of put a damper on the entire. Because here's the thing, I, I what's what's great about the Iliad? Um, no, sorry, it's great about the Odyssey at the end of it when he defeats the suitors, basically murders everybody, right? Um, yeah. You know, and then like has to win over Penelope because Penelope's not convinced that Odysseus is Odysseus because it's been twenty years, and and it's like you know she does her own little like gamesmanship as far as like oh move the bed out for this guy and like you know Odysseus is like that bed can't move it's based on a fucking tree trunk you know yeah <laughs> and he goes oh it is you and, and like Athena basically uh, gives like Helios the day off. So they can fuck for like 12, like for like an entire day, just spend like fucking all night. Uh, and then he just, she just like extends the night so they can just keep going. Oh my and it's God. Like, I was waiting for that moment. And it's like, that never happens in this show. And what happens okay, is like, would... and, and what happens is it's Odysseus is like, ha, I never needed you anyway. You guys are like useless now. Gods like Athena. Holy thing, shit. Like dude, Athena saved your ass. Athena is like the reason you were there, and so is Hermes, by the way. 
you know, so like, that's pretty that's pretty bad. You know, I was joking about like Space Jam, <laughs> about the Space Jam Two version of, <laughs> of Greek myths, but like that's that's actually kind of getting there. <laughs> yeah, it, so that's it's it's disappointing because I'm just like this. Where did that come from? Like, like that's yeah, that's that's, that's not there at all. And like everything else has been done so well. Um, it was because like you can go well. That's it's, it's you can you can take things as like a, a exaggerations or whatever. But like it's it's like a, that was that was um it was that, that was it was disappointing. So that was <laughs> like I, I, so I, I'm I'm sort of rewatching that with a grain of salt again because it's like that's what like the gods can't exist if we don't if they don't believe in us. I'm like. That's not how that works either. If in, in, the, in that mythology, you can. It's it's sort of like I, I remember in that like a while back, like I remember like just daytime History Channel like or Nat Geo, you know, stuff about you know Greek mythology and like how so and so and like you know these are powerful people and then all of a sudden like some a new new power came to town. And it was Christianity and like and that took over Mount Olympus. And, like there was some sort of how like <laughs> it's like that's I mean technically that's kind of how. Uh, eventually, you know, like the way Christianity conquered paganism is a, is a topic I kind of want to get into, not discussion wise, but it's in, in later studies, I guess. But, oh uh, yeah, certainly. Cause it's a fascinating, that's also fascinating. Like where did that, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a cyclical, it's a cyclical sort of thing where you have these humanistic pagan kind of concepts and then like a conservative thing like christianity comes and just like well it turns into a, well i mean it, it, it turns it goes from a uh, um you know it becomes when something becomes like institutionalized you know the thing that replaces it is the uh the thing that re- replaces it is like the populist uh is like the populist reform movement or like the populist revolutionary movement which is kind of the you know kind of the deal with christianity where it's like hey are you sick of fucking giving money to this like <laughs> are you tired of giving money to this like byzantine structure of of deities and and corrupt priests and like you know like roman send them people. to our and corrupt like, priests did you know that <laughs> did you know that also women and did you know that also women and and prostitutes and poor people can also join this religion like that's a good that's a good selling point. Like, <laughs> like you can you can sell you can sell a lot of people on that. I could also probably make the argument things get so dark. Um, like there's like because the hum- we are we are on a very nice trajectory of the human race where it's been pretty for the most part we've been very comfortably going up in the technological uh, cultural cycle. Maybe it, you know until it drops down again to the point, be it like natural disaster or just you know um, carrying capacity or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. Like like <laughs> like um, where like stuff we're talking about. You know, the reason we're talking about it is we want to kind of keep the ball rolling, but eventually it will all be a moot point, and we'll just you know. Yeah, but, yeah. But, I mean, there, there's there's arguments to be made for like you know what happens when we hit. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people are you know point out the. Uh, idea of like we're, we're probably past peak oil right now yeah. and uh it's you know the amount of you know technological progress isn't necessarily like a a, a straight line and that that's kind of the you know event the, the eternal progress is kind of the mythology of capitalism where it's yeah. like yeah man everything just keeps going and we'll get better to better it's like well we're gonna run out of energy to put into the system <laughs> and eventually and so it, we're gonna have to we're gonna have yeah. to cut back on that shit eventually. Well, it, it's it, in in terms of like, and that might be a thing where I'm looking. I mean, at I think the, it might be fo- self induced. Like, I think the you know, well, I mean, maybe maybe if we actually tried to like figure out nuclear power and got figured out nuclear fission, maybe we could do it. But I think oil companies will probably literally just run the planet into the into a dark age, and then and then we'll have to just figure that shit out again. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, like the I, and and looking on a cultural level of that, I think about like, you know, I think Christianity probably had more solutions to those problems than like pagan concepts did towards the uh, 
420, 420, 500, 600 AD kind of area where you had that really, really dark period. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know? When, when your whole life is like, when your whole life is like, well, I'm a slave to this Lord and I'm like literally an object and I'm also a woman and I'm basically just not a person. And, you know, there's just plague. And, you know, I, I think being also more intimately uh, acquainted with, violence and death you know we kind of we're kind of shielded from it now yeah, in the yeah. 21st century but you know when that that hands-on uh that hands-on experience with just violent death all the time um we, uh, it does make that whole that that whole uh, uh yeah man just like all all the only thing you got to do is just believe man like you don't need to do the <laughs> like that it's like oh it's good so you mean the only thing i got to do to to be part of this religion is just you know, just hang out here in my fucking hovel, and then when I die, I'm fine. Like, sign me the we'll, fuck we'll take, up. We'll take a couple. We'll take a couple. Uh, coins, I don't have to go down to the temple the cause, and pay yeah. a bunch of fucking priests to do all these rituals for me. And <laughs> well, that happened you know, too. Have, that, that, well, that happened anyway. You know, that happened yeah, I mean, regardless. It, it, yeah, it's a ra- It's a good racket, man. So you gotta like. <laughs> I mean, Christianity just it just turned into that. So. I mean, it'll it'll probably be replaced by something, something else, some other further mutation in the future. <laughs> All right, I mean, it'll well, be some other further mutation, and then and then that's going to turn into uh, whatever that turns into the state sponsored religion. That's going to suck and get replaced too. <laughs> well, I I, I can't uh, top that. We're running out of time here, but uh, I tell you what. Um, how about we talk about Woodstock next week? <laughs> okay, yeah, let's do it. I'll actually watch it. Let's do that. <laughs> I will we'll rewatch. Yeah, let's maybe we, maybe we, you and I rewatch it together, and then we can talk about it. I know I have a podcast. We have a recording of a podcast earlier that next Thursday, but we'll get it done. Uh, we can do yeah, it. Yeah, sure, later. man. Yeah, sounds so good. We'll schedule it up. Um, yeah, we'll we'll holler at each other. So um, so stay tuned if you really want to hear that. Uh, yeah, if you really want to hear that our our Woodstock '99 commentary track. Yeah, and enjoy King Crimson too, because I, I went to that oh, show. Yeah, I'm going, I didn't even say that on the podcast yet. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go I, catch King Crimson before they all die. So I, I, I was I actually saw that show. <laughs> I saw that lineup in that show in 2017, June 2017. Oh hell yeah! So it's a good show. It's a good. It's it's fun. It's um. Yeah, that's what everyone's saying. I, great... I want to see Robert Fripp and Tony Levin before they die. Actually, I, I, did did Tony Levin play with Peter Gabriel during the the orchestra tour? Because I might have seen him then. But no, but I saw him I at the Canyon so. Club. I, I, I met him at the Canyon Club. Oh, sweet, sweet. Yeah, I'm t- trying to think, I think if I've seen Tony Levin live. I don't think I, I have. So, you remember that time we met his goddaughter? Yes, that was fucking weird. Wasn't that cool? I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I threw that as a I threw that as a, a thing when I, we met him like later that year. And I wasn't I was less into King Crimson then than as I was now. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, that was that was a highlight, brief highlight. I'm just like oh, I remember. <laughs> well, I'm I hoping finger I, painted uh, you in preschool. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping I'm, I'm hoping eventually also to see Adrian Ballou before he croaks because he's not uh, looking too great either. Yeah, he but, was part of that. He was part of that group, the, the Canyon Club group too. Ooh, nice, so nice. We, yeah, he's not on the. I, I think he's not. He's not touring with him this time. But no, Jack Jacko Jazik, that's his name. Yeah, yeah, something uh, like doing, that. He's doing all the he's doing the secondary guitar and lead vocal stuff. But it's cool because it's a pretty much a retrospective. They're not doing too much um like, oh, we've got new stuff. It's like it's it's pretty much a celebration of the band because it's got oh, that's, different that's people good. from different eras. Like Pat mm-hmm. Mastelotto might be for me he's like the Bill Bruford incarnate kind of guy cuz he's yeah. there. With the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh um I still I think it's Mel Collins is on there from the Islands record and the Starless record and, um, and Tony from the eighties onward. Yeah. Um, I think Tony, Tony was saying something about how they're probably not going to tour next year. So I'm like, yeah, this is probably it. a good time. If these Corona variants keep getting worse, it's like now is, <laughs> now is the time to go. <laughs> There's going to be a point where there'll be enough Corona variants where we're just going to be like, fuck it we're just going like yeah we're, we're staying back and yeah yeah we're just, we're just we're just fuck it if they gonna, die they d- die yeah if we, we have one big one going on right now but there's gonna be a couple on the way they're just gonna be like we're not ready for this i'm like bet you not but you know what at this point maybe it's small enough where it's like uh you know it's like 
it becomes like a Nile virus or, you know, like the, the yeah, yeah. what do you call it? West <laughs> Nile or, uh, or, uh, you know, bird flu or like one of those other different, like smaller, but scary sounding. Yeah. Things, I mean, if but... they get bad enough, they're just they'll, you know, they'll just burn themselves out before they can actually like kill anyone. You know, I mean, the, the whole thing is that like, you know, they're, it's, it spreads so bad is because like most people can just carry it and be fine for like a couple of weeks, yeah. you know? So yeah. that, that's why it's bad. So, I mean, eventually if it gets too, uh, if it gets too extreme, it'll just fucking burn itself out. But right. I mean, not that I want there to be black plague tier fucking <laughs> Corona, but I'm not well, saying I don't not want, black plague tier corona to destroy capitalism that you know i'm not well, saying that I, I do want to go back to work with with a job that pays yeah i love cool. i love doing good. podcasts i love lost beat six but lost beat six is mostly funded by live shows and right now we yes. haven't had some in a, it's been a long time since we've had any of those um and right now because the vinyls the vinyls are slower than i thought it would be we're, we'll hopefully have like a couple of vinyl projects by the end of august like either ready for Hell pre-sale yeah. or ready for pre-sale or ready for something so um you heard it here folks you heard it here right, first, stay, folks yeah so. stay tuned for more vinyl <laughs> right on man well i'll uh i'll let you go we'll we'll uh we'll let's talk all about right brother we'll we reconvene next week for yes. woodstock 99, 99. <laughs> Maybe will we do it? You have to be there and find out. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right, me... Steve. I'll see you soon, brother. All right. Take care, man.